Good morning, friends. It's a beautiful, wonderful Wednesday morning, and I'm so happy to be here and greet you. Um, today, I'm going to be reading a true story that is about the person who wrote it. So we will call this um, a memoir or autobiography. Um, it's in that genre because it's a true story written about a person by the person that the events happened to. So uh, the name of this book is The Girl Who Buried Her Dreams in a Can. It's an interesting title, isn't it? And it's by D Dr. Tarari Trent. So we're going to find out what happens to this little girl who buries her dreams in a can and why she does it. Okay. She was supposed to be a boy. Her parents even chose a respectful Shona name fitting a boy. Tararai Shiki Borukramawari. I'm sorry. I'm not that good at pronouncing that. Meaning, listen to the word of the, of the spirit. But on this cold winter morning in a small village in what is now Zimbabwe, she emerged, a ball of fire as brilliant as the sunrise. The baby's grandmother quickly snipped the breath cord and wrapped it tightly inside a piece of cloth torn from the mother's dress. Then she buried the cord deep beneath the red earth. This is our ancient way, the grandmother said. The child whose breath cord is buried in the ground will always remember her home. The little girl grew up in a hut, its, its roof thatched with grass and its walls made of mud. Each day she tended to the family's cattle and fetched water and firewood from many miles away. Sometimes she ran into older boys carrying books on their way to school. Oh, how she longed to trade her firewood for books. But for most little girls in her village, learning and school were but a impossible. If families had any money for school, they sent boys. Girls were needed at home to cook, clean, and bring supplies. Every woman in the little girl's family had heard the word batigone. It was never more painful than when the little girl watched her aunt's dark eyes filled with tears because she couldn't read a letter from her husband. She had no choice but to ask a stranger to read it aloud. This shouldn't be, the little girl shouted to her mother and grandmother. The women agreed. We need a young woman to be our eyes to read and write for her for us, her grandmother said. Maybe it will be you, dear child. The little girl decided she would be their eyes. She would learn to read and write. She borrowed her brother's school book and flipped through the crisp pages. It was filled with pictures of smiling people big cities and tall buildings. Her brother, Tanashi, called the book by a funny name, Geography. My, 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 how the world tickled her tongue. I will teach you how to read and write, he said, but you must keep it a secret and you must do something for me in return. The little girl grinned and made a promise. Tanashi taught the little girl how to read the Shonave through song. She learned the vowels and consonants, tracing each letter in her brother's workbook as she sang their songs. Just as she learned how to sew cloth to make a quilt, the little girl learned to sew vowels and consonants together to make words. 
Oh, how the letters held secrets in the way they formed words. And the words held secrets in the way they told stories. Sometimes she focused so intently on her lessons, she'd forget to watch the cattle, leaving them to stray and graze in neighboring maize fields. The little, girl, the little girl learned quickly. Soon she could read Baba and Amai, the Shona words for mother and father. And she learned to complete Tanashi's homework, her payment for the reading lessons. When Tanashi's teacher discovered the sibling secret, he begged the little girl's father to let her attend school. But before the little girl could enroll, she was asked to perform a test, as every child must. She stretched each arm around her head one at a time to touch the end of her earlobes. If she could reach, she was ready. Oh, how happy she was when she felt the tips of her earlobes with her fingers. Hmm, I wonder how many of you can do that. Can I do that? I can do that. Hmm. The little girl loved learning so much that she couldn't bear to stop when the school day was over. The maize fields became her classroom and the cattle became her students. She gave her students names and taught them science and math, her favorite subjects. As she solved math problems with her grazing cattle, the other, other village children pointed and stared. Why does she talk to animals, they'd say, they can't learn. Soon after the little girl started school, her village began to change. War and drought pushed the men of the village into the factories of the city and the gold mines near the mountains. When they returned, they rested, rested under the broad leaves of the muchacacha trees. They hung battery operated radios from the branches in branches enjoying news of the world. As the little girl did her homework, she'd listen too. The radio programs took her to far away places, Australia, Europe, America. She'd wonder if she'd ever see them. Moons rose and set, and the little girl became a young woman, a wife and mother. Her village became something new as well. The end of war brought hope and change for the next generation of boys and girls. The young mother's heart grew each time she sent her children to school. She fed and loved them, and she fed and loved her dream of learning. Others fed her dream too. Zimbabwe welcomed strangers from far away lands, educated men and women who had come to learn more about the young mother's village and share stories of other countries. One story stole the young mother's heart. In America, both men and women could study their favorite subjects for as long as they wanted. Before she knew it, her dream had grown. An education, but in America. A kind visitor named Joe Luck told the young, took the young woman's hand. If you truly desire this dream, she said, then it is achievable. Achievable, the young woman repeated. Do you know Ghana? Gona, she whispered in Shona. What a powerful word for a dreamer. The young woman ran to tell her mother, you must write down your dreams and bury them beneath the ground, her mother said. Mother Earth will feed them and help them grow. It was an ancient ritual, like the burying of the breath cord. 
Trust the universe, daughter, to honor your dreams. The woman quickly scribbled four dreams on a scrap of paper to travel to America, America to earn one degree, then a second, even higher, then a third, the highest. She placed the paper in a worn tin can. Wait, her mother called. Your dreams will have little meaning, daughter, unless they bring gifts you can return to your people. Always remember your home. So she added a fifth dream to give education back to her village. Then she buried her can in the field where she had once watched cattle graze. Tinogona, she sang. It was a special day when the young woman received a ladder with a strange stamp and a university seal at the top. After years of studying and hard work, she was finally going to America. But before, they, before she could pack her bags, the young woman needed more money for travel. How would she get it? The young woman's mother visited the head man of the village. He had great respect for the young woman and her buried dreams. Without her knowledge, the head men asked each villager to give whatever they could to make the young woman's journey possible. Some sold their chickens, mangoes, and ground nuts to help her. Others gave pennies as a symbol of their love and support. Her dreams were coming true. When the young woman boarded the plane to America, she thought of her mother. When she started her first day of school, she imagined her brother's face. When she found herself at the university library late at night, she remembered her village. When she struggled to put food on the table for her children, she recalled Joe Locke's words. And whenever she felt her dreams slipping away, she whispered, Tino Ghana, it is possible. It was achievable. The young woman earned one degree, then a second, even higher, then a third, the highest, and finally her last dream was fulfilled. She put she brought education to the little girls and boys of Zimbabwe as she had promised many moons ago. And that is the end of the story. But it's not the end, actually. There's a little write up in the back, I'm not gonna read it all, <laughs> about the author who actually uh, wrote the book. And this is the story of her life. And she's actually a university professor. She actually brought education back to her village through um, a foundation that she started. So she is actually a really interesting person. Um, and so if you want to look up more information on her, her name is Dr. Tarari Trent. It's right there. Um, because she's a really interesting person. And um, she made her dreams come true. And I just wanted to read that as encouragement to you because you can make your dreams come true, whatever they are. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. I forgot to say, sorry, I forgot to say that you, if you enjoyed the illustrations, they were illustrated by Jan Spivey Gilchrist. So, um, yeah. So I hope you enjoyed that book. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day and that you are safe and you just are happy. I will see you tomorrow in this space for more Reading with Miss Painter. Bye-bye.